Hello, uh, I'm Paul Beckwith uh, with the University of Ottawa and in this video I'll continue uh, with the um, overview sort of highlights, lowlights of the Hansen et al. Uh, landmark paper. So in this particular video I'll talk a little bit about some of the computer um, models, the global uh, atmospheric ocean global climate models, AOGCMs, um, that uh, Hansen et al. used to try to simulate um, what happened. Well, it's basically a simulation from 1850, run, the model runs up to 2300, um, to try to look at what um, will happen to the climate as you get um, melting from Antarctica and Greenland and that meltwater, fresh meltwater, goes on the surface in those regions and uh, how it affects ocean circulation, uh, sea level rise amounts. Uh, so basically like any, um, mo any simulation, um, you divide the earth up into a grid and then you have different levels both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. So in the particular ocean, for example, it's a four degree by five degree grid resolution, um, and there's 13 layers with increasing thickness and as you move down to higher and higher depths. So um, you basically use um, uh, mathematical equations, and you have a time step, and you run the equations, um, you run the model forward in time, backwards in time, etc. Um, you tweak it to try to uh, represent reality. Um, so basically what they're trying to do is determine, you know, what the system, how the system will respond, how the climate system will respond to, um, to, to basically um, uh, ice melt, which then injects uh, fresh water um, around, say, Antarctica and, and Greenland. Now, um, calving events can take um, the, um, the icebergs that calve off. The coast could travel quite far before they melt, so that can carry the water a long way from the coast. Or if you just have basal melting uh, dominating, then that water um, is released a couple kilometers below where the uh, ice is grounded on bedrock, for example. Um, so one of the key things of these models is the response time. Um, you know, when you have a climate forcing, how long does it take the uh, system to respond? And one of the things in the models is that the sort of mixing rates between water at the surface and water deeper down is very, very important. And the models seem to overdo the mixing. Um, in reality, the water, for example, around Antarctica is more stratified. You know, and then you get the freshwater lens at the surface, um, and that's leading to an increase in uh, sea ice formation in Antarctica over over time. Um, so the uh, so so basically, um, in the modeling experiment experiments, um, Hansen et al. Um, they they you start off with uh, freshwater injection at a certain rate, for example, 360 gigatons a year, which would be one millimeter of sea level rise um, between 20, 2003 and 2015 in the model. And then you have a five, 10, 20, 40 year, et cetera, uh, doubling rate of uh, melt, which would increase the uh, water volume. So then you have a sea level rise increase, and you also have changes in regional regional temperature changes and sea surface temperature from this lens of fresh water on the surface and then that changes the vertical mixing in the ocean and that changes the temperature deeper down and uh, so on. So uh, for example in one of their main simulations um, they had uh, you know by 2065 they had a 0.6 meter sea level rise by 2080 1.7 meters by 2096, five meters. The 2096 one um, represents uh, a rise of about five meter in a century, which is about the fastest, uh, you know, uh, in the paleo record. But the actual fluxes of, of fresh water going into the ocean today are about four times higher than they were in this particular model. Um, and also, uh, it depends on where the uh, meltwater is injected. 
Is it injected, for example, in Greenland, off Greenland? Um, is it injected off Antarctica, or is it a combination of the two? And if it's a combination of the two, you know, what is the uh, ratio um, in the two different things? So these water hosing experiments were were all examined, and it was found that um, you know if ice sheet loss occurs even to the extent of 1.7 meters of sea level rise, um, there'll be an extremely large impact on climate and climate change. Um, and if the, uh, if the injection occurs in off Greenland, then that reduces the North, Ameri uh, North Atlantic deep water formation, shuts down the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, so the Gulf Stream is, is carrying much less heat up north, so more heat goes to the southern hemisphere, um, causing uh, more um, causing causing uh, effects there. Um, now, if the AMOC shuts down, um, then the response time. Now, the AMOC um, effect uh, the the effect of greenhouse gases on the AMOC has been modeled a lot, but much less so the effect of um, freshwater hosing on the AMOC. Um, and it is found that if you inject the fresh water in either the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere or both, um, then you can get an AMOC uh, shutdown. If the AMOC shuts down, um, there's a large t time period before it can restart. Uh, for example, uh, in what is known as the 8.2 uh, kiloyear event, um, the ice dome over Hudson's Bay collapsed, injected lots of fresh water into the um, ocean from Hudson's Bay, and that caused a shutdown of the AMOC, and, uh, or a 50% reduction in the AMOC strength, not a complete shutdown, and it took 160 years to recover from that. Um, if you get this fresh water injection in the southern hemisphere, it causes an increase of ice growth sea ice growth around Antarctica, it causes a stratification, so there's less Antarctic uh, bottom water formed, there's less um, vertical mixing, so the water temperature increases um, deep down and that causes more and more ice melt, so the process builds up in a strong feedback. But if you stop that water hosing in the southern hemisphere, then the SMOC the southern meridional overturning circulation can has a recovery time of, of, of a decade or two uh, from the modeling. So the SMOC shutdown has a much larger global effect than the AMOC uh, shutdown. Um, so, um, so, so basically, the um, so this is all discussed, and then also the and you know this is why the energy imbalance is the most important parameter to look at not just the global average temperature because if you get that you know if you get say 1.7 meters of sea level rise then you have um, large um, regional cooling um, because you have these shutdowns so large parts of the ocean um, become cooler on the surface warmer underneath but but surprisingly enough counterintuitively the um, the energy absorbed increases when you get the cooling. So if you have a large region of, say, uh, the North Atlantic cooling from um, a Heinrich-type event at the end of the Eemian, um, you know, if you have a similar event like that, a lot of cooling, then you get more clouds forming over that cool water, um, which reduces the uh, solar uh, radiation hitting the region, reduces the energy going in, but because it's cooler, there's much less uh, radiation, there's much less latent heat movement and sensible heat movement to the atmosphere. So the net effect is there's a lot more absorption of energy, in fact as much as 50 watts per square centimeter, per, per meter squared rather, in those particular regions. So then that will lead, that's a feedback that will lead to more and more warming uh, because there's a lot more energy absorption. Uh, so the energy balance or imbalance of the planet is the important metric, not this uh, two degrees Celsius guardrail. So there's lots of plots, lots of simulations um, that are done. And uh, so the important results are is that the freshwater injection into the North Atlantic or in both hemispheres uh, shuts down the AMOC. Um, and uh, if the AMOC is shut down, then there's more uh, heat transport to the southern hemisphere, which can cause more melting there, nonlinear uh, melting of the ice caps uh, on Antarctica, 
and that can then lead the, to a you know, lens of fresh water around the surface and then shut down the s mock And then when the s mock is shut down, um, then uh, it, re it takes uh, you know, several decades, a decade or two to, to recover. And then, uh, so you get this seesaw pattern occurring. So you don't get, you know, you get a lot of things going on. Um, now, what's actually happening um, in the, uh, how, how does this affect storms? Well, um, the simulations show that the ice melt in the North Atlantic creates a uh, substantial increase in, uh, in, in sea level pressure. So you get high sea level pressure in all seasons in, in the uh, North Atlantic and um, you, you therefore get larger temperature gradients, larger baroclinicity, larger, larger pressure gradients, larger moisture gradients, and you get higher wind speed. So how much higher? Uh, well, in the model, um, the increase in the northeasterlies, so that's wind from the northeast to the southwest, as I discussed uh, how it affects, uh, how it can create super storms, you know, 30 meter high persistent long period waves that hit, hit the Bahamas. A bit less, a bit short, uh, smaller waves that hit Bermuda, but basically, um, if you increase the wind speed 10 or 20 percent, the energy, the power dissipation from wind goes as a velocity cube, so that would increase um, the storm power from the winds by a factor of 1.4 to two times. So, so this is uh, why you would get, and this would be persistent, constant winds, and this is why you could get, you know these enormous waves uh, being formed across the uh, North Atlantic and that would eliminate all shipping traffic because uh, 30 meter waves, um, you know, no ships are built to withstand consistent 30 meter waves. One rogue wave of 30 meters is generally enough to take out a ship. Um, so all of these models are done using different uh, freshwater forcings and so on and um, it's so basically the, the biggest effect um, is if the if, if the um, AMOC uh, shuts down, it's the effect. It's the spin-off effects to the southern hemisphere that have the greatest um, effect. The, the the more heat's there, you get more wa fresh water on the surface from more melting, and then you get more, you know, heat at that 1.2 kilometer, one to two kilometer depth, which is vital for melting the ice. So for every rise of 0.1 degrees Celsius temperature at that depth, there is an extra one meter of uh, per year higher ice melt of that ice that's grounded. And then it goes quickly and because of the retrograde slope, you get the collapse of the ice shelf and therefore uh, enhanced melt from the ice cap. And then you get these very highly, very strongly nonlinear uh, increases in uh, melt rate. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, um, so, so then then values are, are put in to the model that match sort of today's melt rates from Greenland and Antarctica and uh, you know we find that uh, we're heading more and more to uh, a situation of very rapid melt and it's not just the, the rapid um, melt, um, there's also uh, so you get, you know, when in a warming, warming oceans with more ice melt, you also need to look at the precipitation minus evaporation balance. And what we find is that as the, as there's more warming of Antarctica and you get the frac, the, the uh, sea ice spreading out, then that affects where the snow is falling. So the precipitation minus evaporation factor over the continent is greatly reduced. So that contributes to even more, so the ice is not rebuilt up as quickly as it was previously. And this has a very large effect. So these Southern Hemisphere uh, feedback effects, these, these S, um, the, uh, the S mock um, effects are, are very, very large. Um, and uh, will certainly lead to nonlinear uh, climate uh, climate change. So I'll I'll stop for there.